Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the KCP community meeting for September 6th. Um, we have a very light agenda here today, so please feel free to uh, jump in with anything. Um, I'm going to, if I can find the screen, share it. Awesome. Andy, you have the first uh, subject here for 0 0.8 release. Yes, thanks, Steve. Um, might want to zoom in a little bit to make it just a little bit bigger. Um, so I had two things on here. The first was uh, a an announcement and celebration. Uh, we released 0 0.8 last Friday on time. I believe this was our first um, on-time release since we started putting milestone dates together. So congrats, everybody. I'm really excited about this release. It's a lot of hard work from a lot of folks. We had um, a good group of new contributors as well. Um, I sent an email to the KCP dev and KCP users Google groups with some highlights for what's in the release. Um, the release on GitHub has a list of every single commit that went in there or every PR. So um, please check those out. And um, yeah, congratulations, everybody. I really appreciate all, all the hard work. And the other topic I had was I've got a HackMD open that I'm working on to get our README cleaned up and uh, more up to date. So if you're interested, uh, please take a look. Uh, once I get through my ideas on the draft, I'll probably switch it to a pull request and um, mostly ask that we try and get this in without too much back and forth on the review, um, just so we can get something better than what's there now. And then uh, if there's a lot of stuff, we can follow up with future PRs if needed. So that's all I had. Thanks, Steve. Cool. Just wanted to highlight the uh, new contributors that came in for this last release, um, which actually make up like a pretty sizable chunk of everyone that's that, that put in work. So awesome to see you guys. Um, and uh, barring, if anyone has anything else that they want to bring up, um, please say something now, or we're going to jump into some issue triage. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to bring up the um, bug that I posted. Sorry, I only put it in seven minutes ago. Uh, no, that's all good. The, and it would have been um, in, uh, in the list anyway. But yeah, walk I us through this I just wondered if this is something that you had noticed yourselves or was on your radar at all. Um, I've noticed that uh, I, initially I thought it was related to advanced scheduling because uh, I use that, but it seems like it isn't. It happens whether that's switched on or not. Um, but if I create a resource, um, I tested it with deployment services and ingress and put a finalizer, a regular type of finalizer on that resource and then delete it. The um, KCP reconciles that resource extremely aggressively, um, like hundreds of times a second and is adding and removing a like annotation of a deletion timestamp. Um, and it's, it's aggressive to the point that my own controller can't actually get in and remove the finalizer that's causing the problem. So I just wondered if this is something that you knew about. And I, I suppose um, if not, then what's a, what's a good next step to move I towards that? I had a question, in fact. Um, what what's your precisely your use case for adding a, a regular finalizer uh, on a resource that you want to sync? We we don't as far as I know, if I'm not mistaken, we we don't um, sync you know fin um, regular finalizers uh, on downstream. That's correct. Yeah, and and the way to delay uh, the removal of of uh, sync to resource from the from a downstream um, cluster is to use the soft what we initially call the soft finalizers you know there is a finalizers annotation mm -hmm. so i was wondering is it what what you are trying to do i mean i'm i'm not clear so, about yeah the, the reason that we added the finalizer isn't actually to do with the resource on the sync target it's to do with the resource in kcp uh, 
our controller in KCP, when it sees an ingress, creates a DNS record resource in KCP and then uses that to reconcile the DNS record in a DNS provider. Sure. Um, so when the ingress is deleted, we need to clean up the DNS record on KCP before the ingress is deleted. So that finalizer is being used as a finalizer in KCP. It's not to do with finalizers in the sync target. Yeah, I understand. But yeah, OK, I understand. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe it could be interesting to to dive a bit more in, into the, the whole um, the whole flow here. But I I leave the the one to Andy. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to say um, finalizers are a standard feature of Kubernetes, so we can't have code that does this hot loop just because we're trying to introduce a different way to do finalization so we need to support regular finalizers or like reject them in some way yeah sure, sure, sure. Yeah. phil does that answer uh, the questions you had yeah that's great thanks that's, i just wanted to discuss it with you yeah thanks awesome um, Mac, uh, sorry, Mac. <laughs> Andy, do you have uh, anything that you wanted to say more about the Mac binaries uh, bug? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't know where we're going to go with it. So basically, mm -hmm. the assets that we are producing using the GitHub action with Go Releaser to produce um, our assets for the GitHub releases, so the KCP binary, the Cube Control plugins. The Mac versions need to be signed or uh, either with a certificate or an identity or whatever it is. Uh, so we just have to figure out how to make that happen, hopefully using community infrastructure. Um, I mean, maybe we could get this into Homebrew and then Homebrew can deal with the certificates and we don't have to generate the assets ourselves, but we'll figure it out. Um, so I opened up a thread upstream uh, in the release management channel in the Kubernetes Slack uh, to see if anybody has some ideas just for community binaries and how to get them signed. And yes, there is a workaround, uh, but we don't really want to tell people to do that long term. <laughs> David, this is the new epic that you put in. Yes, exactly. So I added a, a, a comment in the community meeting as well. Uh, I created two new epics, this one and, and the next one, uh, mainly and moved some of the remaining tasks that were remaining action items that were in the you know multi-transparent, multi-cluster, big epic, because obviously it was covering more than than the initial purpose. So. Uh, this one is mainly uh, about the transformations, I mean, the remaining work on the transformation and also coordination controls. So the, the initial epic, uh, the, the issues were inside, was much more focused on, you know, the location workspaces, uh, being able to define the locations and APIs on one side, and then having a user from a user workspace, workspace being able to bind to compute um locations but then uh, there is everything related to supporting multiple sync targets uh, allowing the support for coordination controllers and it seems to me that it's you know really a, a distinct or a follow-up that we should you know have in a distinct epic and and then be able to show in the more precisely in the roadmap uh, for kcp so that that's the main goal of this this one is to still to be done. I didn't feel everything and still probably should have some discussions uh, on, on details. But Are you thinking still... this is a multi-release effort or is all of this something that is going to get done for zero nine? Uh, I mean, I, I think part of it uh, at least would be for, for zero nine. Obviously, we, we until 
you know we we see differently uh, merging the transformations for example uh, so maybe the third first points would be uh, 409 so I, I i'd propose let's let's put that 409 without a milestone blocker so that it can split in 0 010 at least for the last parts of it obviously in the description i would probably add some you know uh, stretch goals uh, that would go beyond 09 i assume does it make sense cool chris yeah uh, david could you describe like the high level use case here sorry i just got a bit lost um yeah the thing is that uh, it, for example inside a location when you think of uh, moving from one sync target to the other at some point you might have uh, the syncing state you know the the the, the label on on uh, individual resources that says to which sync to which sync target you want to sync uh, you might have two labels at some point you might have to play with the soft finalizers that means to delay the removal of um, um, workload on one cluster before everything is created correctly on the second cluster. So there might have some, some coordinations to, to you know, manage in all these cases. And even more, if you have um, uh, resources which is shared, you know, assigned to two locations explicitly, in case, for example, of deployment spreading uh, across two regions. Then, obviously, you have to tackle things like how to maintain one status for each sinker uh, for all, for the KCP resource because each sinker will report its own status based on on you know what has been um, uh, uh, created as a deployment on every uh, physical cluster and so and then you have to manage coordination controller which would have the right to you know the ability to see every sinker really every sync target related status and summarize that into the main object. Precisely, you know, the, the typical example is the deployment spreading case where, you know, you um, send half of the um, uh, replicas on, on two sync targets. You have a status for every replica, uh, every sync target, and then you just summarize the status by a coordination controller uh, in the main object. So that's mainly setting up all the, the, the minimal um you know framework and and kcp primitives to allow external services like hybrid cloud gateway to to uh, do this type of coordination does it answer yes yeah thank you so one is movement of resources from one workspace to another from from one physical cluster to another actually behind the scenes yeah and you the have other the... is just deployment spreading so that the topology yes, of a exactly. single thing actually okay Right. But the two use cases boil down to requiring the same type of KCP primitives, in fact. Thank you. Cool. And it sounds like some of these uh, fine grained stories will uh, come later. Yes, so, sure. Awesome. We'll put it in as your night for now and, and split it later. Um, and then you had the compute type management which yes. just after which is uh, also a, a follow up epic based on on the initial one uh, 9102 if i remember correctly and this one is related to the remaining work about uh, placement and locations especially the fact that currently um, you have uh, you know all the compute apis um, cube mainly apis in, every, in any case, they are imported from the physical cluster, which is uh, the physical cluster is the source of truth of the cube API schemas, for example. And we want to change that so that we have global uh, API exports uh, in KCP for you know every cube main release for OpenShift release, for example. And then you would bind to this and only check the compatibility of the schemas with with the the corresponding APIs in the same targets. So it's a sort of reverting the way we do and, and having um, API export for all the compute types available centrally in KCP. 
to for, for users to bind to that and then obviously uh, you would be able to choose the locations and also to have placement and scheduling of sync targets based on the availability of apis availability of apis in the sync targets so it's it's yes mainly implementing this uh, so parts of, of the work has already been done by Jan uh, from the ACM team, and there is still you know, some things to do here. This would include also removing the sync targets argument from the syncer, for example. You know, removing the resources to sync argument, because everything would be stored on the sync target. So this epic was created as well to, to provide more visibility in the road in the KCP roadmap of the road. Cool. This makes a lot of sense. And the uh, associated diagram, very simple. So it won't be a problem, right? Yeah. And so this one, I think we can put to 0 0.9, at, at least that's yeah, the goal, because Jan would, would work on that. From now on. Um, Paul, do you have anything specific you wanted to say about this documentation, please? Uh, no, I just wanted to make sure we didn't lose that in a comment chain, okay. so I, I called it out there. Okay. Why not? Um, let's see. We have the issue already talked about. Joachim, do you want to talk about scheduling cluster-wide resources? I think we had him with us earlier. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if you are can is there or or oh, no, okay. Might be technical meeting technical yeah. problems. Yeah. By the way, this is um, uh, I, I can just say two two words. Mm -hmm. This is um, part of uh, m uh, the more general work uh, about storage, the storage epic which includes the some requirements in terms of kcp primitives mainly this in this is you know yes that's strange that it's not inside it already but yes uh, mainly about the storage uh, epic we we need cluster-wide syncing cluster-wide resource control as well and so guy is working on the storage epic and all the parts to add inside the sinker and in the meantime yeah. hey yeah. can you hear me now yeah yes so uh did you explain it david already uh, i started but i i actually <laughs> leave the rest to you <laughs> okay so yeah uh, it's part of the um storage epic and part of the up syncing uh, so basically we need um, some kind of controller that takes care of uh, scheduling resources that are not uh, namespaced as it says cluster-wide resources so then this controller will basically add to those resources to the cluster-wide resources all the possible sync targets that are available to the workspace, um, all the labels, without the intended state, the desired state, so empty state. Okay, then a third party, well, a coordination controller will be able to uh, switch the state of um, those sync targets as, mm. as it wishes. Yeah, and, and this also contains, uh, as point two, um, the, the changes inside the sinker to also support syncing uh, yeah. cluster-wide uh, resources that are exposed by the sinker virtual workspace. 
based on, on the synchro on the request state level. Yeah, the, there is a, there is something which is placements, as you know, um, target uh, have a location selector and a namespace selector, which means that the placement can target two namespaces and not uh, other namespaces in the workspace. But for this kind of resources, we don't have that. I mean, we will just ignore the namespace selector on placements, but we need to discuss what to do there and and what uh, sync targets to expose to the coordination controller. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are obviously things to, to precise. Yeah, yeah. Do we have ideas on what kind of changes we'd need um, I'm thinking about like collisions between cluster-wide resources on sync, and then how that might impact the order in which different objects get synced down. I think these are open questions, and it would be great uh, that you, you know, dump all, all the, the those type of questions you yeah, that, that raise in your head, um, everyone uh, in, in the issue, and then we can also have additional brainstorm or design session to, to tackle those those things. The the short point is that it's obviously at least a, a feature we need. And we need something to start, something simple to start to unlock and unblock uh, the, the uh, storage work and, and allow it to continue. But you know, gathering all the all, all the impacts and, and, and challenges here in the issue would be really great, I think. Yeah. I guess I'm wondering, like, do we necessarily need this to be a, a broadly scoped feature for all cluster scoped resources? Um, do we expect the approach to be exactly the same for all of them? Would we lose something if we did this just for storage? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's well, also a question I, I I think we can we can you know ask and maybe choose that uh, it might be easier to do something storage specific, but obviously we don't want to multiply resource type specific uh, behaviors inside Seeker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris? I mean, oh sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Oh no, go go ahead. Working. I was going to ask a, a higher level question. Please go ahead. Um, I mean, basically here, what we are going to do is not really schedule those resources. This controller will only expose all the schedulable sync targets to a third uh, controller, which will be the uh, coordination controller for storage. So there will be a set of coordination controllers. Perhaps some of them will be in KCP by default. But those coordination controllers will be the ones that have specific knowledge of the objects. For example, um, where to schedule a physical volume, where the physical volume claim is. So that's a specific controller for, for storage. But this controller will only expose uh, all the available sync targets to that cluster wide resource, not syncing down anything. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it makes sense to have a little bit further discussion on this because anything that is cluster wide has the ability to kind of shape the ability of a cluster to actually support a, a workload. We we're having some interesting conversations about policy in relation to this and the ability to reason about a cluster. Um, when multiple people can change kind of the underlying shape of that. Um, maybe with storage, it's it, it's something that we can make a, a trial run with, but it'd be weird for, for it to say, this, this cluster used to be able to run my workload because it had this storage thing, but somebody somewhere else changed that and now it can no longer run the workload. That's actually related to that point. Like Oh, that was related to the point that I was going to make, and actually a question is if we have explicit recommendations on whether the physical clusters should be dedicated purely to KCP or if they can be used as 
for direct workloads and as a destination for workloads that KCP also manages. And this seems like the place where those kind of conflicts would show up. Yeah, so obviously there, there might be, you know, we should have additional discussions about the limitations. I think it's what we are saying today. And now the limitations about uh, cluster-wide uh, thinking and possibly some, you know, settings or some some rules uh, to explicitly uh, allow only some types or things like that. We have to define yes. the, the limitations of, of the process. Obviously. And possible name transformation to avoid collisions and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, David or Joachim, do you want to put something on the calendar uh, for this week's to chat about this? And we'll keep this out of the, the milestone until we have a little bit more clarity. Uh, yeah, or maybe what, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe do you think it could be uh, preferable to split this issue into two? Because there is the, you know, cluster-wide um, resource controller that is, you know, adding the labels based on the placement and all this we can start now because it doesn't sync nothing. It syncs nothing on the physical cluster really it's just you know puts the the right levels so that the coordination controller can start its work but then yeah, then we have the second part of it which is real thinking obviously which raises the the security questions you were mentioning yeah um go ahead andy i would second steve's suggestion to talk through the use cases um i think that makes more sense in my mind than proceeding initially to do the labeling work if we don't know or aren't confident that we have the use cases ironed out. Well, and, and I think it really depends too, like if the approach is different, similar or different between different types of resources. Um, I think that'll. Uh, Paul, you. Uh... You were mentioning plus one to three, I'll run it. Yeah, with this use case. Mean, yeah. Just just agreeing to what we're saying. Like it makes sense to talk more. Yeah, the thing is, uh, I don't know if Guy is here. I th think I saw him previously uh, in the meeting. I yes. mean, obviously, it's something we will need for storage in any case, but we can also decide that if there are, you know, unknown too many unknowns related to cluster-wide thinking seen as a general thing. We can also decide to come back and, you know, have only thinking of the PVs with, you know, very um, limited uh, access, which is only the, 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 the features that the storage use case would need. We could also come back to that if you if you think it's a safer approach for now. I think it really depends, right? Because like other cluster-wide resources, right? Would this allow me to sync CRDs that I've this created in my workspace using an API binding? You know, questions like that come up when you start looking at this as a cluster-wide general concept, and they might not be questions we even need to worry about solving to make sure that storage has a good story. So let's find some time to, to think through this um, this week. I think if everyone's had a little yes. bit more time to, to think, we may have a, a, a good conversation. Yeah. yeah, for sure. But this is not syncing anything down. Just, OK, it's just leveling with all the possible locations, well, sync targets, where another controller can actually decide to sync down something. So. I mean, it's more or less safe on that regard. Yeah, yeah, but but um, um, Joachim, I mean, I if I am, if I read correctly in the issue, the second point you mention uh, in the description uh, yeah. still mentions the the required changes to the sinker. So when you know, if you if we do the required changes to the sinker to handle cluster wide resources, we still open the door. Yeah to you know if someone manually for example sets the you know the sync uh, uh, label then we would still open the door to you know 
well, thinking <laughs> you're actually doing it manually i mean okay i understand it can have yeah I mean, but it's, uh, it's a question security, of security implications yeah, exactly yeah. Well, I think they cannot change that those labels because there are those are protected by admission levels, by by authorizations. But okay, okay. Uh, at, at least we have to, to refine the, the the impacts of of the the second point. David, I agree. Yeah, sure. Sorry for jumping in. Maybe uh, this was when we discussed the uh, feature gate uh, uh, might be in in a good case. I don't know. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, helps me as well. Because obviously a feature gate would be sufficient in the sense that all the um, resources now, exp I mean, synced by the sinker, go through the virtual workspace. So, you know, just through a feature gate, you can decide not to sync any uh, cluster wide resource, not to expose any cluster wide resource in the, virtu in the sinker virtual workspace. So, that might be also. A way to have, you know, the both the, the best of both worlds. Mainly, just start working on it under the the feature, uh, common feature gate, so that uh, guy can continue on this. We can start, you know, experimenting with that, uh, experimenting with the general also impacts of of cluster wide syncing. And once we are okay, we can, you know. Move the feature get to to default. And do, do you think it could be also you, like so? If and I think at some point too, we might be getting into a lot of uh, technical details about this particular one. Um, and the the broader group here might not have as much uh, to say. But yeah, exposing sync target specific details also presupposes that a controller. Will then be able to access, like, you know, if we're talking about some coordination controller that can then do something with this information, if that's not the same, here. we're also presupposing a, a specific type of access, a specific type of permission to like read the sync target data and then do something with it. So I think, yeah, that, even that's starting with this labeling puts us down a very specific path, and we might want to think through if that's. I mean, that, that's already something we have discussed with Stefan and, and Guy and others uh, long ago about the coordination. And that's related to the coordination controller <clears throat> uh, APIC that I just created previously. So obviously, it's it's work that is being started uh, to be done in parallel from, from uh, you know, the transformation peer, from uh, the coordination controller work. But all this has already been, you know, designed. Uh, quite for some parts of it quite long ago. So yeah, coordination controller, for example, cannot add a new state internal label. It can change the desired state of that label, for example, of the same target, but it cannot add new. So that's why we need this kind of uh, controllers. I mean, all, all this all this mechanism here with the labels is already working in the resource. I mean. Uh, yeah. Today uh, and implemented for namespace resources in the resource controller. So it's not something new that we are setting up here. It's just um, going one step further than what we have today. Today, the resource controller creates those labels and directly put the sync value in it because for now we don't really use coordination controllers. But from the start, if you look into, let's say, API uh, comments, for example. From the start, the idea that was that in the final state, I mean, long term, um, the resource controller would set this label to empty, and this would this is the signal for optional coordination controllers to decide when we should start syncing, and and then add the sync uh, value into those labels. I mean, that's something that has been designed uh, quite from for for a long time. And and you know I I'm not aware of any change in the design since then. That does it answer, Steve. Steve. I think we're getting into a lot of uh, details where even I'm getting lost. Um, it it sounds like fundamentally there are still some open questions about 
like broadly syncing cluster-wide resources. I think we should take some time this week to chat about this. Um, I'm not sure that. Yeah, I mean, no, no problem for deferring this for a day or two uh, makes a significant difference in velocity. I guess um, if you're worried about that, we should chat. Are you okay with I us think... taking the approach? Yes, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I mean. Uh... I'm hundred percent okay for with with I mean everyone interested in having a, a a design discussion to to see the impacts of this. I'm not sure I'd recommend you know you uh, to completely stop what he started. I mean, but I don't think he. I'm not sure you're very far in in the development anyway. So um, it seems to me that that you know one doesn't prevent the other. Sure. And, and you know, we're taking time this week to tear about these things. So sure. you, you, yeah. tomorrow we should have, like, but it shouldn't take long to resolve this in, in chat. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. And hopefully, I mean, obviously, having Stefan also give his thought on this uh, would be nice, I think. Sure. Uh, Are you okay yeah. to move on to the next uh, issue? Yeah, I mean, it's okay for me. This one is part of, uh, um, let, let me speak about this because I think Jan is not there. It's part of the consume compute transparent multi-cluster. You know, well, no, it's part of the new, I didn't change here in the description, sorry. It's part of the new epic compute type management, exactly. Um, that's just one step of it. Uh, the other steps I did not create, you know, detailed issues for now. It's mainly changing the sinker uh, so that uh, instead of taking the re resources to sync argument into account, it would mainly look into the sync target in the status and take the list of the sync resources that is in the statute of the sync target and be based on this. <clears throat> so yeah, that's one step, one more step into into the you know the overall process of going towards uh, common global root compute API exports. Gotcha. Any reason why we would be doing uh, this instead of discovery, API discovery on the virtual workspace? Uh, what, what do you mean? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, so I guess my understanding was uh, we are so by inverting the control here, the sinker is ex expected to sync everything that they see in the virtual workspace. Yes. So that uh, I'm wondering, in order to get the list of possible API resources that they need to go, the sinker needs to sync. Um, this issue currently says to go look in the status and sync target. And I'm wondering what the difference is doing that versus doing API discovery on the virtual workspace it's using. Well, there are two, probably there, there are, I mean, when, Jan opened these issues, probably he had two things in mind, which go hand in hand. The first one is that this to, to, this to sync, the sinker just has to sync everything that is exposed from the virtual workspace. But there is another aspect of it, which is that we still want to um, import the schemas. You know, the sinker also at start for now, uh, imports the schemas of, of the various resources to sync into the location, into the, the sync target workspace. And, and we would still continue doing that uh, to check the compatibility between the global uh, API export, you know, Kubernetes API export, and the schemas of the corresponding um, APIs as they are in the physical cluster. And to drive this import, we would use uh, the content of the status of the sync, sync target status. So the sync target status sync resources would be used to define um, what we have to import, uh, you know, to, to check compatibility. But as for what we want to sync, uh, we would just, you know, have to, to get everything which is uh, exposed by the virtual workspace. Does it answer your question? Uh, kind of, Andy? 
So the first sentence under proposed solution has the discovery bit. Uh, that was what you were asking about, Steve. I am curious, David, what sets uh, status.synced resources? Is that just a, is that the list of everything that was discovered? No, no, no. In fact, it, it's something which is already implemented. In fact, Jen already worked on it. Um, it, it now in the sync target in the spec, you have the list of API exports. It's not oh, used right. for now, but it will be. And, and based on this list of, you know, uh, supported, expected supported API exports for, from the, the, the sync target, um, we look for uh, API resource imports in the, in, in the workspace of the sync target. And we get the schemas from there, compare th those to the schema of the expected API exports. And for all that are compatible, that are present in the sync target in the, in the you know, physical cluster, and that are compatible, we set a status, uh, we set a value on, in the status sync resources. So the sync resources mainly contain the list of all the GVS, which are present, which are expected, you know, which are part of the uh, global API export, and which are present in the physical cluster in a compatible with a compatible schema. Okay. This is al already implemented in a controller. The so whole point now question, is, yeah, sorry. if we're getting rid of the resources to sync flag, which I'm in favor of, um, yep. how can I say, well, I, I like that there's this global Kubernetes or OpenShift export that's yeah. got all the schemas defined. Yeah. And I want to sync all that stuff, but I also want to sync Tekton pipeline runs. How do we do that? Yeah, so that, that would be done quite a bit the same. That means that on your sync target, you would add an, uh, you know, in the spec, in the supported API exports, you would add a new API export, but not pointing to the, you know, root workload workspace, which contains Kubernetes and OpenShift API export, but you would point to your workspace in which you have manually imported, manually create, created an API export with your, you okay. know, schema uh, for k native or anything else that exists on your physical question okay thanks but in okay. fact this is not the first step of the epic i mean I, obviously there would be some some other uh, tasks to do before for which i didn't or jan didn't create a, uh, an issue for now but and maybe in the list in the when, i guess what is when is this set of synced resources different from this set of discovered resources in the virtual workspace? Yeah, in fact, the, 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 the set of resources that will be exposed by the virtual workspace will follow the, the list of the will follow the list of resources which are in the status. I mean, one is the input of the other. Which one is derivative? All the resource types, which are all the resource APIs, which are exposed by the Synco virtual workspace for a given Sorry, I mean, which which of these two concepts is like the source of truth? Synced resources is the source of truth. Okay, understood. But in the Synco, you have two things. You know, you have syncing the objects, and then you have importing the schemas, and the Two different uh, these are two different things but for syncing the objects you would just sync everything you find in the virtual workspace okay cool this makes sense maybe this is a quota flake I, I looked into this and couldn't figure out why this happened Yeah, I mean, it, it. there's some sort of timing issue in there somewhere. I think somebody said that they wanted to take this on. Yeah, so we let's target 09 for it for now. Uh, Andy, do you want to walk through this bug? Yeah, um, so the um, sinker tries to 
patch things um, in the downstream or physical cluster at times. And if that fails, the error is logged, but the user has no idea what's going on. And so in uh, the examples that I was debugging, um, somehow a deployment CR managed to get its spec deleted entirely in the KCP workspace. And then when that got synced down to, um, to Kubernetes, Kubernetes said, yes, yeah, spec is required, or like various fields underneath spec are required. And there was no way to tell that was the issue. So we need to have a condition somewhere on ideally the deployment, like it, it needs to be visible to the user. And if the user can't see the sync target, which is potentially common, then uh, at least we need to have it on the deployment and maybe we can put it on the seek target optionally. Yeah, and, and and should it be something common to any object? Oh, yeah, it's not specific to deployments. So, or maybe on an annotation or something like that? A condition, needs to be a condition. Condition. Okay. Ideally, I mean, it, it or you, if it's an annotation, there needs to be something like in a cube control KCP plugin, which is like, Cube control KCP. Tell me why my thing is not syncing. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I, mean, I, was, annotations. I was just thinking of if it's something generic uh, for resources where you don't have any conditions, but there are not many, I assume now. Sure, like a config map doesn't have yeah. conditions. So, but that's the gist of it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's quite important for usability. Is this something we are throwing into TBD for now? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the, the general approach is to scope 0 0.9 when we're ready to and like timing is kind of tight and we haven't been really been doing a good job of this we we throw a bunch of stuff in tbd and then it kind of stays there um if we had longer release cycles like more than a month where we could spend a day or two going through all the tbd issues and deciding what we want in the next milestone that'd be helpful um but it's kind of tough right now okay well sometime before september 2099, I think we'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, Sarah, are you here? Uh, he had to go. He had to go. Okay. Yeah. Um, TBD. Yeah, this is the. So when we embarked on all the virtual workspace implementations, um, we basically said that we need to offload the filtering of objects onto shards themselves instead of having a larger in-memory cache in the virtual workspaces server. That means that right now we're doing quite a lot of like large label selector sort of stuff. Uh, it's unclear today what the performance implications of that are and how it scales. Um, there's some breadcrumbs here for like default sets of indices that get created in the watch cache. This issue is basically a question mark of like, do we, will this approach continue working <laughs> and to what extent when we increase the number of objects? Mm. So Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so the the alternate would be uh, to send to the shard some instructions, and the shard itself would do the the filtering, and then you would not, you know. Uh, well, so that's what we're doing today with the label selectors. Uh, the question is more so on the API server side. What's the implication of that? Uh, 
often like we're 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 doing half the work it, it's sort of two-step right like we're doing half the work in a controller that adds labels to something and digests some other part of the object into a label and then we're just using the label selector during the virtual workspace delegation um we haven't yet hit anything where the inability to do a disjoint selection on labels makes that approach impossible but we're not sure if like the structure of the api server and the uh, watch cache makes this reasonable at larger scales okay uh, you can imagine without an index for each one if it's doing a full iteration mm -hmm. problem. OK, yeah, thank you. And like the, I guess in many cases, the perfect solution, if one were to exist, would be like a complicated field selector, because ultimately we're selecting on some part of, of the object. Mm. Um, Lukash wrote this. I think it's fairly. There's part of this in the PR that Paul opened from my Google Doc with the REST URL patterns, because part of it had storage in there. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to combine efforts. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of towards the bottom. I think, yeah, this this concept is rest patterns. So uh, whether we do it all in this one or, or we follow up with another one, I think that, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, and I, I was chatting with Paul um, last week about, like, we can just submit additional commits to his PR. Yeah. And um, you know, if anything needs cleaning up. Gotcha. Since this is docs, we'll put it in nine. Maybe something we do this week. Um, we've got a PR open for this one. Um, Should we pull this one as well? And do you think it's like something we should probably come out of this week with docs on? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Cool. Thank you. Oh, cool. And then we had that. So those were all of the issues we had. Um, we spent time on. Two of these epics. Um, I know there's been a bunch of work that happened with the cluster workspace type stuff. Andy, do we want to run through that here? Um, I only have a couple minutes left. Oh, that's true. I, I think a lot of these are going to. I expect there to be a lot of movement on on these epics this week. So I think maybe we'll have better conversations next week. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, any other topics anyone has while we have a couple of minutes left? Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Well, see you all next week. Thanks. Bye.